Thank you all for joining us this morning for this presentation on the Seattle Squeeze and its impacts to uh, film production in Seattle and uh, what the city of Seattle and state of Washington are, due to, are doing to um, assist productions in staying in Seattle and continue to bring productions to Seattle during this period of maximum constraint. My name is Chris Swenson. I'm the Film and Special Events Coordinator and Manager for the City of Seattle's Office of Film and Music. Uh, in the room we have our director, Kate Becker, and our film permit specialist, Taylor Skaggs. A uh, couple notes about today's presentation. Um, we will be taking questions, but the questions will be in, in uh, the form of Skype texts. I think that's the best way to, to call it. <laughs> uh, everyone is muted here for the, uh, for the purposes of going through the presentation in one big chunk. Please keep your notes or just go ahead and type them in uh, and your questions as we're going through. At the end of our presentation, we'll read through those questions, and then we'll see if we can unmute for a, uh, for a general conversation if, as needed. All right. Um, keeping film production local during the Seattle squeeze. Uh, everyone should be familiar now with the term Seattle squeeze. It is uh, what the city of Seattle and the region are calling uh, our current and, in, and upcoming period of maximum mobility constraint through the city of Seattle. Uh, this presentation is to walk through what to expect during that squeeze, during that period of maximum constraint, and uh, some of the major pro major uh, projects that are going to be happening that are going to be impacting Seattle mobility. And then we're going to take a look at uh, the ways that we are currently working on, as I mentioned, uh, continuing our support and attraction of uh, film production in Seattle as competition for public right-of-way increases. All right, during, so the, the Seattle squeeze is a softer term from the period of maximum constraint, which is what uh, we've been operating under over the past year or so. The period of maximum constraint actually started as a term called grid collapse, when Seattle a few years ago uh, realized that several major uh, projects and the confluence of loss, the loss of the viaduct and uh, other factors are all going to combine together over a period of years to really affect mobility in Seattle. The city is working with uh, regional and state partners in general for awareness and for mobility, uh, working with King County Metro, for example, um, to try to make sure that transit is operational and, and is flowing as much as possible, working with the region's emergency managers to make sure that as traffic is moving more slowly through Seattle that emergency vehicles can get through. Also working with uh, delivery or companies who, who need uh, really rely on delivery services for products and uh, other items so that they, that can get through as well. So it's an all hands effort to, to keep uh, mobility uh, a priority or at least cars moving as much as possible. During all of this work, while we're trying to keep streets open and clear, uh, why would the city and the region still support film production, which is actually an antithesis to that in, in a lot of cases, having a lot of uh, street use needs that don't always support mobility. And I'm thinking of uh, car chases and car commercials and things like that that close down streets. Well, the first reason that we're doing this is that the film production is our office and the state film office's first priority. Uh, uh, getting and keeping jobs for crew, keeping production houses and companies in town and vendors in town and working is, is our number one priority. Film production, as we all know, provides thousands of high wage uh, uh, creative jobs in the region, which is a, a key component of our livability. And film production is the center of what we call the creative economy. Um, anything, so how goes film, so goes everything else in the creative world and the creative sector from our perspective. Our window into the film production world is, uh, for the city of Seattle in our office, is through our permits. And our permits are just a snapshot into what is actually happening out there. You only need a permit if you're filming on public property or if you need some sort of public property use. So this is our snapshot into, into what, uh, what we're seeing and we understand this is just a small slice of what's actually happening. We permit about 500 permits a year, 500 or a little bit more. Out of those film permits, we film, or within those film permits, there are about 2,000 on average per year filming days uh, throughout the city. 60% of our film permits that come to our office are commercial or corporate work. 
20% are feature film and episodic, and the balance um, of about 20% are the mixture of still photography, student films, and other uh, short film projects, things like that. From our numbers, about 50% of our film permits are local, and local meaning city of Seattle generated, either by company or by production. About 5,000 or so local cast or crew per year are hired, according to our film permit data. And the public locations that are used in the city of Seattle are about 60% in parks, 30% on streets and sidewalks, and about 20% of our film permits reserve some, or have some sort of street parking reservation. Not shown here is a very small number, but we, we do have about 15 to 20 uh, drone permits per year, too. So that's a, growing, that's a growing tool that's being used by uh, film productions as well. With that as an understanding of what of work that we're looking to support and continue in the region, I wanted to walk through some of the impacts that we're going to see over the next few years uh, as part of the Seattle squeeze or the period of or the continuing period of maximum constraint. And these um, will continue to have impacts on how we move and get around, not only in work but and personally as well, and, and uh, how you get to your place of business or to your filming location will be impacted. Uh, because of all of this uh, this convergence of major projects. And a quick run through of each of them that this starts really, the, the first day that this starts is on January 11th when the uh, SR99 viaduct is closed forever. And forever means forever. Uh, there's On January 11th, there's a three week period where both the viaduct and the tunnel, which is its replacement, will be simultaneously closed. That three week period is scheduled for the dual closure is, is put together and scheduled because WashDOT needs to connect, needs to disconnect the roads leading into the viaduct and connect them to the tunnel itself. And then once that is done, after about three weeks, then the tunnel opens and you have access to the tunnel, and then the viaduct is, is begins demolition. The viaduct will be, is scheduled to be completely demolished by summer of 2019. I think the original date was June 1st, but that might be pushed back uh, to July because I think they had a late start on it. It's a little bit unknown, but it'll, it'll be down by the end of the summer. So that's, the, that's the first major uh, impact. What happens with that, just a, a quick note, is they're not throwing all of the everything, all of the rubble into the water. They're actually trucking it out. So there will be 24 seven trucks moving out as it's demolished for that six month period, both from the north end and the south end. In March of 2019, uh, all of King County Metro's buses are uh, removed from the downtown tunnels, uh, bus tunnels, and moved up to surface streets. This is because the tunnels are now going to be exclusively light rail tunnels, and buses will not be able to use them anymore for a few years now that they've both used them together. And that's going to be a major impact because of the hundreds of bus routes that are going to be displaced and now on surface streets in addition to um, uh, the loss of the the, the viaduct itself. Uh, the, uh, a couple other, or the ongoing, the other major projects that are going to be lasting through 2024, uh, the Fairview Fairview Bridge is is the bridge between South Lake Union and East Lake. You don't, th it doesn't look like a bridge when you're on it because it looks like just like a road, but it's actually a very long bridge. They have to demolish that and rebuild it, and that's going to be that work is going to be happening through the spring of 2020. Uh, through the fall of 2021 is the key arena redevelopment. They just broke ground on that, and that will also be hundreds of uh, haulers a day moving things in and out, mostly the rubble for the first first uh, portion, and then the building on the second portion, and that's lasting through the fall of 2021. The Battery Street Tunnel, which was the north portal to the SR99 viaduct, is going to be decommissioned as well. They are filling that in for safety and other reasons. Uh, I know that there's a lot of folks who are hoping that that would remain a tunnel and be used for something else, but they uh, unfortunately cannot. So that will be um, decommissioned, filled in, and that not only impacts the tunnel itself, but also the surface streets above it. And that is, as you know, Battery Streets uh, between First or between Elliott Avenue and Sixth Avenue. That will last until 2021 as well. The convention center is, uh, uh, the expansion is underway right now, and that construction is going to last until 2022. 
Uh, it's, I'm, it's hard to grasp how large that is. It's pretty contained to its footprint, but again, it's uh, it's the it's all of the mobility around it, getting into it and out of it to make to do that construction is going to be impactful. And then, 2024 is the expected completion date for the waterfront redevelopment. Um, that is still projected for 2024. As you know, the waterfront's been torn up for probably about four or five years already, so this is a decade-long impact down on the waterfront itself. As a side note, uh, you know, part of part of the payment for that work was going to be a, uh, a, a new tax to downtown residents and businesses, and that is in contention right now as well. So hopefully that will not extend that, that deadline and that we're still looking at the 2024 end time for that. So that's an overview of the major production or major projects that are coming up. This does not include the 70 or so cranes for private construction that are also happening at this time. All right. As I mentioned, the major impacts begin when the viaduct closes on January 11th. What we'll see immediately, or what we're expecting to see, is the impact of about 60,000 vehicles a day that, you, that currently use the viaduct will be displaced and will be pushed onto surface streets. For that three-week period when the, when the tunnel is also closed, they have to go somewhere. And the expectation is that they'll go onto surface streets and that they'll go to I-5 trying to get to or through downtown Seattle. This is a significant new normal for uh, all commuters of any type, whether you drive or you take transit. This is There's going to be a period where certainly this three weeks is the, is the starting point, but there will be a period of readjustment for almost everybody before we start to, we as a city and a region, start to settle into a new normal. And those traffic patterns will definitely change, as we note here. The, the biggest things about the, the, the uh, tunnel that are different than the viaduct are, as you see in the two maps, the viaduct has several exits and entrances on that, that were available to get to downtown, into downtown from the viaduct. Those go away with the tunnel. There's just a north portal and a south portal. So there's no way to get to downtown if you want to just pop off the tunnel and get to a downtown location without using one of those. That is another... Uh, surface street area on that north and south portal where we just don't know how it's going to look. It's going to be uh, impactful and tough to get through. We don't know exactly what it's going to be like yet. So managing the public right-of-way during this period of time. We know now uh, our Department of Transportation has informed uh, all departments and uh, the public that, that during the viaduct closure, uh, permits for street use will be rescinded, and that means anything. So if, it, if you're looking at the Skanska construction down on 2nd and Union during that three-week period, they're not going to be allowed to move into the street for any hauling, for any setup, or anything else. The, the intent is to clear everything from the streets and the parking lanes so that traffic mobility can continue as best that it can for that three-week period. That also impacts special events, it impacts uh, moving and haulers, and it also impacts film permits, which we'll get into in a moment. After that uh, reopens from 2019 through the, through the end of this saddle squeeze, which is projected for 2024, this still means that there is going to be more comp uh, competition for street use. Uh, these, per these construction companies and everyone else still need to do their work, and so uh, our work supporting film is not necessarily a conflict with that, but it's in competition with that. Uh, this map, uh, uh, to be specific about this map, there it's maybe a little bit hard to see on your screen, and we'll share this with you after the after the presentation. The dark green streets are the streets that, during that three-week period, will not be able to have any permits on them. The light green streets are the arterial streets that they need to that need to be kept open and flowing. So there may be restrictions on those as well. Anything that's not light green or dark green should be uh, operating as normal. In the future, after the uh, tunnel opens, we may see something like this continued by SDOT as far as prioritization of keeping streets open. We don't know what that is yet, but uh, we expect that something like this on a reduced scale may continue. This also means moving forward to 2020 to 2024, uh, that access and across town will be limited as well you'll still be able to get across town. It'll just take longer for you to do that. 
We expect that uh, street parking permits and traffic control may be a little bit more, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say difficult, but maybe a little bit more scrutinized uh, as we look for permissions on, on uh, those for film productions as well. Um, and the last item here, uh, Seattle police officer resources will also diminish uh, during this period. Um, officers will, certainly during the three week period, will be assigned to traffic control to help uh, vehicles be mobile. And moving forward after the, after the uh, tunnel opens, officers still may be assigned to assist other, other issues, which may reduce the availability of them for uh, film productions or other work. Speaking of film productions and other work, what does this new normal over the next five years mean for a film production in Seattle? In addition to all of the construction permits that have, they're literally being taken away from contractors, film productions from our from uh, that we receive are also restricted. So that dark green street configuration, it's 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 unlikely that anything would be able to be permitted during that three week period on those streets. The light green streets are a case by case basis, and then like I said, anything that's outside of those that uh, uh, should be uh, business as normal. The intention with that map again is to keep that downtown mobility moving. Moving forward over the next five years, as I mentioned, uh, some street use restrictions may continue, may have limited access to some popular locations, and uh, I'm thinking specifically of the waterfronts. That work will continue in, the, in a uh, very grand scale. Uh, Pike Place Market will be easy to film at inside, but getting around it into it may be difficult. That's the limited access we're talking about. We expect that film productions will need to look at alternative filming locations in Seattle and then also outside of Seattle. Film productions will also need to adjust their location schedule. So if, if historically a production has filmed on Ballard Avenue and then popped down to Pioneer Square and then popped over to Alki in a day, that may not be doable to do those three locations all in one day just for the fact of the difficulty getting between those locations. And while the last item here, while we are, of course, it is our priority and our, our number one priority to support uh, and encourage and bring film production and keep film production in Seattle, uh, turnaround for our permits that we issue may take a little bit longer in certain cases. With all of that, again, this is kind of that, uh, I think we called it a shock and awe <laughs> uh, discussion about what to expect. There are some things that won't be impacted. Uh, roving and B-roll permits in Seattle should not be impacted at all. It's, it'll be up to the productions to, to uh, be as mobile as they can and as small as they can, but the smaller uh, uh, productions and crews um, should not be impacted by that at all. Filming in most parks is not gonna be impacted on uh, during this time. Again, the difficulty will be getting to those parks, but the actual work in the parks should not be impacted by this. Uh, ENG and medium impact, medium impact packed productions should also not be impacted. Once you get over three or four pr production trucks and you're in the downtown core, it's going to be difficult. But if you're that size or smaller in any part of the city, that should not be impacted as well. Filming on private property, of course, our permit process does not include permissions for productions to film on private property. So that is not impacted by this except to say that if you're parking a lot of vehicles out of that side of that private, private property, in certain locations it may be difficult to do. With all this in mind, uh, uh, the Office of Film and Music is working on ways to mitigate these impacts to film production. Our top priority is to keep film production local, and there are several ways that we're several things that we're doing to work towards this goal of while some productions are being displaced by in certain locations, we keep that production work local, both for you, for the production companies, film crew, and out-of-state productions. Our first step is partnering with Washington Filmworks. We've already started a program and a process where we're engaging regional municipalities for a across-the-board coordination and support of film production. We've met with Everett, Tacoma, and Shoreline. We're meeting with Renton in a week or so, I believe. And we're going to be expanding that to other local municipalities that uh, 
that become and and stay a priority to the region. The reason that we're doing this is we want to make sure that we're aligning all of our efforts to support film production. We want to make sure that the permitting process is streamlined between each of these municipalities so that if you call us and we can't get something for you that we're able to hop you over to Tacoma and that is the same or a similar process of support and uh, streamlined permitting to, to the extent that it is possible. We're looking at, we're creating a uh, list of prioritized filming locations and looking at office spaces that might be available in these other municipalities. And we're assisting the navigation of different permission, uh, permission processes. So that goes back to the streamlining our, our processes in general and the efforts to do that across the municipalities. The Office of Film and Music is contracted with two location managers, Dave Drummond and Ken Coble. And what's, uh, uh, what, we're, what the contracts and our work with the location managers is to create a large or at least a comprehensive portfolio of alternative locations for some Seattle locations. You're, we're not gonna, you're not gonna find the Space Needle in Everett. That's not what we're trying to do here. We're looking for that downtown, shiny building, three block stretch where you can get that car commercial done. If you can't do it in Seattle, what are the, what's a regional partner municipality who can, who can get that for you or get a similar look to you? If there's a mid-century modern neighborhood that you really like in Seattle but you're not gonna get to it, where is that in another municipality? Parks with Rotter, et cetera, those types of things. This work also is, you know, we, we, the city of Seattle has the luxury of the Office of Film and Music and a permitting process. Uh, most cities, most of our regional partners don't. So we're, you know, the, the contracts and the work with uh, the film uh, location managers is to help educate and walk them through that process, what to expect when a big film production comes so that uh, that doesn't scare anybody off, things like that. These, uh, our, our contracted film location managers will also assist us in, in uh, helping productions navigate new location realities. If you're used to filming in Seattle, but you need to bump out to Shoreline, things like that. And also, uh, as we mentioned, assist productions in different, differing permit processes. If it's a little bit different in Tacoma, they can help walk a, walk a production through that if the production needs that assistance. Jerry says, help us help you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, in a nutshell, we need, while, while we're doing this work to support the industry from our perspective and from our vantage point and to our expertise, we really need uh, help from the production as well. We need your brains to, and your great thinking to uh, really brainstorm some creative ideas and, and pathways around uh, some hurdles that we have because of this maximum constraint into keeping productions here. We want to make sure that uh, productions aren't messaged, an out-of-state production or, or production who normally comes to Seattle aren't messaged necessarily with, oh no, Seattle's going to be more difficult, difficult to film in, I'm just going to go to Portland. We really want to start working with the productions and uh, crew and experts who are you to figure out ways how to message that better, how to make sure that they're still coming to Seattle and knowing that in Seattle and the region and knowing that production can still happen. This can be uh, by working with you and identifying pi uh, popular private locations that we may not know about through our, uh, through our film permitting process. Um, and also modifying ways of, uh, that we can take to keep you and your clients and your productions informed on how things are going in Seattle. There are a number of, uh, as an example, there are a number of portals that SDOT and the city have, SDOT, the Department of Transportation and the city have put together for general awareness. How can we tailor those to the film production world? We don't want, we don't necessarily think that you need to know how long it's going to take to get from West Seattle to Pioneer Square, but if there's a production with a couple locations, how can we message the easiest pathway to get there or the easiest alternative location, things like that. With all that, um, I'd like to open it up to questions. I'm not. I haven't seen the uh, the question list, uh, so nothing has popped in yet. I'm going to uh, give a couple minutes for folks. If you're if you're on your computer and Skype, please go ahead and type in on the message some of your questions. 
I'll give a minute or so to, uh, to populate those if anybody has anything. And then we can uh, unmute everybody if we don't get any questions there, just for a general discussion. And while you're typing in your questions, I wanted to uh, open it up to Taylor or to uh, Kate, Taylor, our film permit specialist, or to Kate Becker, our director, for any comments or questions that we missed. Nothing from Taylor? Nothing right now. Nothing from Kate? I'm going to see if I can unmute us just so we can have a uh, conversation. Um, I don't think there's, there's a uh, unmute button here. I apologize. So hopefully we can uh, uh, have a text Q&A here real quick. I see someone is typing. Question is, uh, that's, that uh, their online app has crashed and difficulties having difficulty seeing visuals that we're presenting, asking if we're recording this. Yes, we are recording this, and we'll share the link with everyone. Kate Becker has a, an item to add, coming over to the microphone. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to say that while we're in this period of Seattle squeeze, um, as soon as you know you have a production that may have location challenges given the impacts to our city, please do call us so that we can be early in trying to help you troubleshoot that and get our loca hired location managers on board to help troubleshoot that. But the sooner you call us, the more likely we are to get to success, obviously. Thank you, Kate. And that's actually, um, uh, that reminds me of a question that we had uh, yesterday as well. Um, I th what we're also doing, while we're prioritizing general locations that are replacements for some Seattle locations that may be difficult, we're, actually, we're also putting together a prioritization list and a look ahead of the year. So we're expecting more car commercials to come in. What are we going to do in response in advance to that? We would expect that, um, although it's not for sure, but we would expect Major, larger productions like uh, Station 19 or Grey's Anatomy to come in for a week or so. How are we identifying and prioritizing that in advance so that they're not caught in, in those? And we would ask uh, productions, as as an echo to Kate, if you have, if you even know that six months down the road you're going to see a larger production or expecting something in a specific location, let us know now. Let's work on it together and let's prioritize that as we as we work through the year. All right. I am uh, going to give one last chance for any other questions. Hopefully everybody uh, was able to follow through on the presentation and was able to hear everything. Uh, this has been recorded, so we will uh, include, uh, we will follow up with an email sharing the recording of this presentation with everyone. And uh, we're always available for phone calls or for emails if you have any questions following up. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and end, end our call today. Thank you again, everybody, for participating.